Okay, everyone. I am really pleased to welcome you tonight to the Locust Roundtables. Um, as you all know, uh, Locust Roundtables are open format discussions and topics in contemporary art proposed and moderated by members of the art community in Miami and beyond. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Maria Elena Ortiz um, from PAM. She's in the curatorial team there. And um, she, this evening, wanted to talk about curating in the Mexican heat. And um, I also am very pleased to introduce Manuela Garcia, who has come actually in from Mexico today uh, to join us. Um, I think for a couple other reasons as well, in addition to this talk, but we're in any case very happy to have you here. And um, I'm just going to let Maria take it away. Uh, sort of at the end of the conversation, uh, we just have a couple of these clipboards. They help us to continue this program, so if you wouldn't mind just jotting down a little couple words, that would be much appreciated. And thank you so much, Maria. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so tonight I wanted to talk about um, what I call creating heat, which is um, really pertains to um, kind of an experience of artistic production right now in Mexico City, where I used to work. For that, I invited uh, Manuela Garcia, who is an artist in Mexico City and um, who recently completed um, the SOMA program down there and who I ended up doing uh, projects with when I was working in Mexico City. So I got to Mexico City in 2011. I was coming down from um, San Francisco. I just finished like curatorial school at California College of the Arts. and. <laughs> Kind of out of serendipity, I ended up in Mexico City. It was very much like talking to artists, which I was working with in San Francisco, who advised me to move to that city because there were a lot of things happening there. And that like um, my resources would be very well used in that context. Um, I didn't really know that much about the Mexican art system. But I just felt like it was 2010, the economy here was like completely collapsing. And so finding a job in the US was a bit hard. And I also wanted to work in Latin America because I was born and raised in Puerto Rico and for me it was important to be in that context. So I ended up working in Sala de Arte Público Siqueiros, which you, saw, you, see, you see an image here on the back. It's a small um, art space in Polanco, which is like one of the nicest uh, neighborhoods of Mexico City, very close to the Museo Tamayo, if any of you guys have been there. And it's actually the old studio house of the Via Fausiqueiros, who is one of the three main Mexican muralists. You might know about Diego Rivera, uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, and then Siqueiros is the third one, who was pretty much um, interested in the relation between arts and politics. Like he felt like attempting to shoot Trotsky was the same as painting a mural, which he actually tried to shoot Trotsky, but he failed. Yeah, um, uh, and he was arrested actually in front of this house in Polanco back in like um, the 40s and 50s. Um, now, I should also say that uh, the Mexican system in terms of art it's very different than the US system. This is the inside of the house where you can still see uh, some of the murals of Siqueiros that he did. Siqueiros was actually known as the most experimental one of the muralists. He was known for painting with auto paint. And also this, this term coin uh, control accident is coined to him. He was actually a teacher of Jackson Pollock in 1936. And there's been multiple exhibitions about the relationship between Jackson Pollock and David Paul Siqueiros and how Siqueiros influenced Pollock in his work which you can really see here, you know, in terms of angles and so on. And also the type of paint that he was using. Now, going back to that, the Mexican system and how it works. Unlike the US in which museums are privately funded, museums in Mexico are funded completely, like 90% by the government or more, like they're government institutions. Because of a very early, a, you know, from a very early point in history, going back to Diego Rivera, the Mexican government was really more, he was, they were very much interested in the potential of art in society and how can art used through governmental and political means can really shape the social context of, of a country. And for example, some of you may know that, you know, when Diego Rivera was painting his murals, he was making a picture of what Mexico was 
that included indigenous people that were very much like completely disenfranchised for a long time. So that means that bureaucracy, it's extremely important in, to work in these types of places. And, for, and bureaucracy in the terms of, for example, if I, our budgets were decide, designated by the government, so they would tell us, okay, you have, I don't know, um, uh, one million pesos to, to do exhibitions, it's like $100,000. We would divide that within the year, and we would also have to spend the money the way they would tell us to spend it. So basically, you know, the, the INBA, which is the National Institute of Bellas Artes, which is who would fund our projects, they would tell us, okay, you can only pay for artistic services, you can only pay for like um, traveling of exhibitions, you can only pay for very specific ways. And also that meant that um, in order to have cash, it was almost impossible because they had all the money. So if we wanted to get any cash flow, we would have to send a formal letter to the director, who then has sent a formal letter to her subdirector, who then agrees if things get funded. And so that means that there's around like three different signatures in order to get like 50 pesos to buy a hammer and to do this. So that really meant that we had to be very creative in how we handled the money and how we um, um, use costs within our budget. Like, and that meant that, for example, we would hire artists in different ways in order to be able to pay them for artist fees. At the same time, um, I would add that I was coming into Mexico City as a foreigner in a place that is very uh, traditional, it has a very much history, and it's, a very, it's very different than here. And by that I mean that there's like more museums than in, than, than in New York, and there's also different, let's say, classes or stratas of artists. Thinking about Siqueiros, he was making work like in the 30s and 40s, he had like his disciples, and so on. So you would have this um, holy cow stuff they call them, or schools of creativity that are being, that at the same time they're supporting younger artists, which is really great in a way. Like you see this a lot with people like Gabriel Orozco, who he has his people, his group of artists that he's supporting. So, um, and I was coming as an outsider to an institution. I was also quite young and coming into this very formal structure. So, there, um, I did a few projects, right? And again, you know, we would, um, the thing about the Siqueiros, the Saps, as we call it, is that it's also, uh, we were interested in political art and also art that dealt with experimentation. So one of the biggest trends of the museum is that it has a big um, uh, archive on Siqueiros' personal stuff. He was like a fan of science fiction. He was a, like very quirky. He also had like this big library that was divided into art and politics and other. So people like he was very quirky in that way. And artists were always fascinated with working with this archive. And we also kind of pushed them for like experimental and at times like this, which is a work by um, um, Rita Ponce León, who is an artist from Lima, working in Mexico City for the past almost ten years. She was also at the Ungovernables Biennial and uh, in the new museum a few years in 2013. And she was also, you know, they would always want to work with the archive and she went into the archive looking into images of Siqueiros and who, and, and to try to recreate a deconstructed idea of who the muralist was. So, you know, just to give you like a sense of the type of, of projects that we would do there with, um, kind of like the limited funded things that we had. For example, in this, in this particular work, she was very interested in doing a video room in this space, but that meant like, if you see on the top, there's like a bunch of windows that look like almost like a, like a tennis court type of, like a sporty thing. For us to cover that, that would mean lots of money and we only had like 10,000, maybe, maybe $8,000 to do the show. So we could not do that. So we opted for a different solution, which was to actually put the video and cross it to the wall, which is what you see. You might not might be able to see it very clearly here, but it's basically this little square right here. This is like another side of like what she, the intervention that she did at this space. Then I also did a, um, another project, which was part of our um, facade project, in which it was a performance piece 
which again, like, you know, we had to really be creative in terms of what we could do and what we, could, we couldn't do. And in this work, um, it basically, the art, this is a drawing that the artist decided to put as part of the invitation of the exhibition. And it was basically a performance theater that was happening every, every three weeks in the space. And, that, and, and one of the biggest discussion in, in this project was, for example, uh, paying the performance, performers. Because in our, like, in our roster, in our idea, you know, we couldn't explain to the IMBA, to the National Institute of, Be of Bellas Artes, how we were you know, pretty much financing like, an artist who was paying then a bunch of artists to do this performance piece. The work was actually, it was like a shadow of puppets, like a, pup, like a theater of puppets, in which uh, we, um, at night, we would uh, use like a clear paper against those crystal wall that you saw at the beginning of the presentation. And people will, um, uh, would stamp the, the pieces of the paper, which is what you see here, throughout the performance, and you would see you know, how the, the end result that you would see it. And of course, something that you notice from, from this type of projects, it's, it's precariousness in terms of exhibition making. Um, the negotiations weren't as precarious, but, um, uh, but the, the thing is, um, I also wanted to mention this other project again. We want to do a retro projection, like basically putting a, a, a projector against the wall in reverse to show a series of videos, as well um, as a object that you're going to see more clearly. Basically, it's a project by Isaac Torres. He's a young artist who also um, wanted to burn this old uh, bus and which we couldn't do at that act in that street because the museum is in a very nice neighborhood and the police were, and the neighbors are really much um, uh, very nervous about burning a car in front of the museum. Also, um, after we put it out there, we would get calls from the neighbors all the time because they thought it was garbage and how can this like trashy like bus could be in front of the museum in their nice street. And we would constantly have to be kind of talking to the police to let them know, like, this is part of the exhibition, this is part of the exhibition. You know, the idea of the artist was quite ambitious by doing, like, the retro projection. Like, it called for, um, uh, like, a projector that probably had, like, 10,000 lumens. We, of course, were unable to, like, provide that. So we had to do things in very um, uh, kind of, again, uh, precarious ways. But they would, they would at least look good within different moments of, of the show. Now, when I start working there, again, you know, oh, and this is another project which I feel like um, is a bit more successful in terms of like budgeting. This is a project by Carlos Mota in which his proposal was to just paint a pink triangle in, in front of the facade. The pink triangle is a symbol um, very tied to homosexual oppression in the 20th century that the Nazis used it to um, stamp homosexuals within the regime and he's been he was studying the symbol for a long time and he actually started to trace homosexual histories in Mexico City so his pictorial gesture was just to paint the triangle on the wall and that was like very 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 cheap and then everything else we spent on um, creating creating public programming for this show and that meant we did like a like a poster with the history of the Pink Triangle in Mexico City, as well as different um, public programs like this one, which is a tour called um, the Joti Tour, which is Joto in Mexico, it's like a bad word for homosexuals. But this tour traces all the different places in the old colonial history tied in the old colonial, um, the site of Mexico City tied to um, to their history. For example, one of the presidents uh, of, of Mexico, one of the liberators of Zapata, he was known for having a lover, and this was the type of information that we would give out in this type of tour. Now, as I was working there in a very much institutional setting in which um, 
I don't know, I guess I start questioning a lot in terms of like what are the productivity of institutions and I think that in the place where I was at in that concept it became a bit more obvious because you know money was so scarce, there were so many politics involved, there were so many, you know, everybody was watching you into what you were saying, the things that were not that you could not say. I really started um, thinking about other ways to produce exhibitions that could really be um, more meaningful, I guess. Also, something to consider is that, um, you know, at the time that I was there and, and, the, and, the, and even today, there's a lot of artists working there and a lot of artists thinking about what it means to build a generation because they have a history of what, of generations. You know, they have the muralists, they have the conceptualists. So there was certainly this energy of what we can do as a young generation working in Mexico. And that is how I started actually generating some projects with Manuela, who is also an artist and who was also coming from a foreign place. She um, is originally from Medellin, Colombia, and who, like me, were very much interested in how to create a space for exchange between the local community and between us and how to really you know, engage with them. So that is how we ended up creating this, like our first project together, which is actually in an old colonial house in Mexico City. The project was called um, San Jerónimo 31, which is actually an address in... With a very strange story, no? With a very strange story, yeah. yeah. This house was actually, um, it was owned by a, a, a member of the British royalty who went to Mexico to kind of invest and create his own little exotic place. So he bought this property. But I think that's something that happens a lot um, for foreigners that venture into this type of space is that, it, is that it's really hard to figure out how to make business and how to really work within the Mexican politics. For me, it was easy because I was inside of the political system, being a creator in a, in a museum there. But for somebody that is just buying a house there, trying to figure out how to make this like an industrial site, it was quite hard. And he also became pretty much like he was also a borderline alcoholic. So although he was able to buy this house, he was never able to make it into what he wanted, which was um, a mosaic, uh, a fabric for mosaics. And actually, you know, there's a history of foreigners coming into Mexico City trying to create like their little um, um, like exotic spaces. Yeah, like Gilitla, no? like Gilitla um, down in Mexico, which is like a, a site created by this kind of like fantastic architecture that this other European came into Mexico to build his um, uh, little like kingdom situation. So now the thing about this space is that because of, of its condition, basically it was owned by this like member of the British royalty or whatnot, and he couldn't make any money with it, he started renting out the space to people who a lot of them end up being artists. And the place was just the way you see it. Like basically if you would rent the space above of it, like that would be like your apartment, I guess. And you would like just make the walls and, and be there. There wasn't no like, I don't know, like internet or like, you know, you have to make your own shower also where you can find the water. And it ended up being a, an interesting space in the sense that um, a lot of artists started living there and trying to make exhibition. And actually, Manuela, when I met her, she was about to move into that space. So we did this project, which San Jerónimo 31, which is at the address of this of the of where it is, because um, the the when when we got there, supposedly uh, Stephen, the owner of the house, he was about to sell the house. The actual selling of the house did not happen after like actually recently, and this is like yes. 2011. But um, uh, he kept saying, oh, I'm gonna sell the house, I'm gonna sell the house, everybody has to move, so you know, we need to like, you know, you guys have to leave. All the artists have to move out. So that is how we started doing this project, which basically, you know, we felt like it was a very interesting opportunity, not also to, as a site, because the house is actually quite beautiful, you know, but also as a space to create a common ground. So we started inviting people to participate, some of them who were um, local and others who were from the outside. Because, you know, I'm, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, so I wanted to work with some Puerto Rican artists. And then I brought in some um, um, people from Colombia, 
we're all we also be able to make connections with um, people from the Mexico City and we also through other informal networks were able to get people like Andri Sala in the show mm -hmm. and that also created a really like interesting dynamic because suddenly we had like a big diverse pool of artists and people would recognize the Andri Sala name and they would certainly go to the exhibition or would yes. be interested in participate um, but but at the end of the day, it was it was almost like an excuse to for us to 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 do a show. For us, it was very important also to do um, publications, which is something that we tried to do every time that we could like work together, because um, we felt that that's the way that things remain in space. So we would, you know, go into like printing houses, just do a text with some images, put it on Illustrator, print, and there we have a publication. Again, like just doing everything ourselves without any particularly seek for um, paper funding because we did have some funding in terms of like getting the house and getting the works and whatnot, um, and also, and also, it was uh, certainly a negotiating endeavor on multiple parts, which I think certainly point to certain aspects of the core of what at some point created could be, which is like negotiating in politics really. Like some of the first things that when we uh, approached this, this man for do the show is that he wanted to include one of his works for the exhibition, which actually this mosaic, this is in the back. So we felt obligated in a way to really put that, that piece there because it was his house and something that, that he was doing for us. And, and to create a discourse, no? Yeah, and to create and also to create a discourse yeah, with the with the history of its of the house itself, uh, within the this the within the within the works within the exhibition. Now these are other views of the of the show. And something that happened though at that moment, this was like twenty eleven, uh, was that other, like at the same time we were doing all projects, other people in Mexico City were also doing projects and a lot of people were kind of also kind of trying to make their own spaces because the same reason, you know, talking about institutions, how political they are and how traditional they are, there's certainly like a lack of space or one could argue that there's a lack of space for new voices within that structure. So um, this is how this next exhibition came about, which is actually um, a project uh, done by the, the students of SOMA, like the SOMA is an auditorium at our school in Mexico City, which some of you might be familiar with. Basically, um, similar to here, there isn't a, like a, I, I mean, I don't want to use the word legitimate, but there isn't like a, a art school that gathers a bunch of professors that are constantly doing lectures and are constantly bringing artists into the, the art scene or whatnot. So SOMA, it's something that started a few years ago, created by artists to mm -hmm. give um, uh, art classes to people. Hmm. But it's more like the Whitney program, right? A lot of theory? Um, yes. Yes, yes. There are no workshops. Mm -hmm. or spaces to work, no, it's yeah. a lot of theory, yeah. It's, it's very interesting because it's like a alternative or independent place, but in the same time, it's not exactly independent place, no, because they have money from people and they have com compromises. Um, they're committed to, yeah. Yes, too, you know, and then how much, how much independent you can be when you have, um, Compromisos. Uh, okay. Commitments. It's also, it was also started by artists in, a group of artists in Mexico City, Joe Tracon, um, uh, Eduardo Baroa, who was here recently. And they come from a particular like group of people in Mexico City. Like, I mean, I cannot like stress this any longer. Like there are schools in the, in the scene and those schools are very tied to specific politics of artistic making and also of, of everything. So now the interesting thing about this project is because um, uh, the curatorial role in a way so politicized in Mexico, the students there decided to have no curator for their project. So they uh, took a space in, um, in uh, the old 
uh, church. The old church of it's like it's called Esteresa, which is also an art space um, in from the INBA, from the government, and they took and it's very iconic. You know, it's a very you know old place, and they decided to just do projects responding to the space. This is actually Manuela's project, which is basically a set of um, hanging, um, how do you call that? Um, swings? Swings, yes. yeah. Two swings, uh, unidos por la misma cuerda. That, yeah, the two swings that are tied by the same, or that they're built with the same rope. Mm. So, oh. um, uh, so people can just like walk in there and just like play with the swings. No labels, no wall text, no nothing. Just like an invitation mm -hmm. to go to this space, mm -hmm. you know, and to go to the exhibition. Which again, you know, I think in a way it points to sometimes the limitations of institutions, you know, and, and, and the type of productivity. I think, I mean, maybe not limitations, but that different spaces give different, could give different types of production um, in terms of art making and what that means within just, you know. There is one thing, one very interesting thing. I'm trying to speak English. Yeah. Um, when Eduardo Baroa, uh, who was the coordinator uh, of the project, say, hey, okay, we have a space, but it's a very complicated space because it's very big and it's very symbolic. And, okay, yeah. Uh, it seems like a problem, but the same thing uh, seem, did seem like a problem was the thing that made uh, for us the possibility to create inter interesting pieces, no? For example, I thought, okay, uh, I, want to, I, want to try to, I want to try to draw in the space with movement. And then it's not necessary. It's not necessary to put a lot of things in the walls, and it's not necessary for to for to come on, Jenar, for to fill to, to fill the to space. Fill the space, yes. And more or less in the same way, everybody did. Everybody of us did, no. Uh, and then, yes, the limitation was a a, a good thing for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And that thing that we didn't have a curator, no? Yeah. And then we, uh, nosotros solos, ourselves. Yeah, we, we them themselves just did the whole yes. exhibition intervening with And we had uh, one thing very strong um, sobre, over us, sobre nosotros, yeah, that I like was it the first exhibition, the Soma first exhibition. It was not very, very good, no? And people say, no, but the pieces maybe uh, they are not together, or they are yeah. not they are not doing a discourse, no? Because um, uh, Soma is also a very young space, and actually, it's like the second show that um, uh, that they did as a class. So um, you know, you know, the first show that the Soma kids did was pretty much very um, criticized for its poor quality, um, and I mean. Something to say about that is that critique is very, very much something that is very embedded in also in that context. Like people are pretty much very critical about like exhibitions that are happening, the work that is happening, and so on. Now, this is another work by a local artist in which he created a book about a performance exhibition that never happened in the 90s. So basically, he just created like an exhibition kind of something that never happened, spoken in, uh, written in Braille. Kind of again pointing to the inaccess inaccessibility of um, this thing that never happened. Mm -hmm. um, this is also another project by another uh, uh, artist in which he created, like you know, just simple geometric forms realized just by um, coins. taking coins that are out of circulation because they are. Some of you might know that um, Mexican currency has changed a lot over the past. 50 years, so there's a lot of money that is not used anymore and that is worthless. So he took some of those coins and just like grind them all together and just make geometric forms in the space with, you know, inside of the, of this old church, which, you know, it's quite interesting in terms of when you think about like, you know, the, spa the history of the space itself being so Baroque and he taking a geometric form with um, an object that is also charged with history in a way. And this another shot of that of that intervention. Mm. This is um, another work 
which is actually made with um, bullets of uh, people from the Mexican soldier uh, military. You know, uh, when we think about schools in Mexico City, like um, there's certainly a school very much deal with political art, but also with violence in political art, which we think about Teresa Marigoyes, for example, people that are very much interested in showing art in very like specific political terms and using sometimes the body, and in this case, like bullets. Guns are actually legal in Mexico, like they're not easy to find. In, I did a project with um, an artist from Cuba with Fidel Preto that we could never find a bullet that he needed for his one of his interventions. Like they're not as easy. And we tried getting that bullet, um, but we couldn't. Um, <laughs> to the pito. Yeah, we went to like to get the bullet and it was impossible actually. Um, and then this is another, this is actually a drawing of an artist in which he drew different squares with um, kombucha tea. So basically throughout the course of the exhibition, the, you know, the drawing turned black. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Now, this is actually a, another project which um, we thought it was interesting to include because I think that this context of certain precariousness and also artists trying to, having to create their spaces, their own artistic venues, it's very similar in other contexts of, um, Latin America, and this is actually a project that Manuel did with another artist in Colombia in a space called Casa Siete in Medellin, <coughs> kind of following again um, similar type of gestures of you know going and creating one's own publication, which I mean, which there I think in Mexico or Colombia is quite easy because printing is quite cheap, and materials are also quite cheap, so you can just like put a text together, design it on InDesign, and hit print and you get like 1,500 copies like within two days, like quite mm -hmm. easily. Um, although, you know, I should also say that sometimes you also kind of take advantage of the materials, of the, of the precariousness of the material. So I don't know if, um, just to kind of give a glimpse of, but again, you know, kind of like the similar aesthetic of taking a space that um, this is also in a house that the people Taller Siete is also like in a workshop with artists that they live there and um, uh, they do certain, they do exhibitions there and it's quite easy to participate or to engage also as an outsider because it's just a matter of like buying your own ticket and getting there and they'll be like happy to. Yes, to you have uh, the pieces in the luggage yeah. and yes, we uh, can put the exhibition in your bicycle and you can <laughs> Yes, yeah. the, this last exhibition was like that. No. Okay, uh, we have we have to go to to do the montaje, the installation. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, it's not like I, I don't know, like you just do it. And then, I mean, lastly, um, we also wanted to mention, you know, the emergence of like art spaces in terms of artists and people doing projects, you know, on your own. Right now, is kind of like peaking over there and there's like this new space that started like um, 2012 called Crater Invertido who was pretty much supported by people like Abraham Cruz Villegas and other main artists because um, there is a really nice tradition there of like support from older artists to the younger generation like that that kind of like responsibility people take on to kind of nurture um, the next group of artists and they kind of, they again, they started similar, with a similar idea like with that much of this project start, which is like we want a space, we want to create our own moment, we want to create our own generation. And they basically all got, they did like a co-op, so they all put money together to like rent um, a space. And, um, and that only lasted a year because that was actually quite expensive to do and quite problematic. But what did happen is that they started getting a lot of attention and they also started doing a lot of projects, like different types of projects. Like this is a scene project. Um, this is a, something that we actually participated in, which was like a, almost feminist. like, it's like a feminist, it was like a feminist conversation between women, um, which was kind of strange in a context like that because feminism in Mexico is quite yes, strange. Yeah, it was very strange, but it was very important. Too. Yeah, of course, because it certainly created a, a conversation for talking and for women to talk in a place that 
you know, something that I had to do a lot working in the museum to get stuff done is like flirt with people. You know, I had to call the government office and be like very sweet and be very like smile and dress cute, you know, so that they would give us like a thousand pesos, like a hundred dollars to like get, I don't know, a hammer. Um, <laughs> of, uh, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is like another thing that um, they're doing is that they're actually now um, they're actually now going to go to the Venice Biennial, so um, they're um, they're now which has created like another controversy in the city because um, they're now I wanted to put this here which is not working um, they're now um, they're now. Um, yeah, they're now going to be in the Venice Biennial, which in Mexico, you know, that's a big deal for, for everyone. And, but in a place, but people are now attacking in the, in the scene. They're attacking them for kind of like selling out and kind of like pretending to be something they don't, or using a certain language to get themselves yeah. into the Biennial. Which is, um, I actually think Eduardo Baroa was also kind of criticizing. Or no, 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 Eduardo Baroa is, is with them. Yeah. But Javier Toscano is against them because uh, he said that is no true. They are uh, inter interested about politics yeah. and it's only the way from, from the no mainstream to go to the mainstream. Yeah, you know? that's a strategy of, yeah, no mainstream to mainstream. Uh -huh. So that's really what we wanted to talk about today in terms of like, you know, kind of highlighting like what was happening in another context to, I don't know, to generate some type of discussion. <laughs> yeah. I was curious to know um, about, because I, uh, as you said before, the government has a large percentage of approving profits over there. I was curious to know if, if you had certain projects that were difficult to to launch and you managed to do it in a different way, or some of the projects that didn't make it conceptually because of political reasons or what have you. Were you successful or unsuccessful in doing those yeah. projects? I, yes. There's oh, a project. And one more thing out of my career, after you answer that question, yeah. one more thing. How is feminism in Mexico different from feminism in Miami? I mean, okay. In, Okay, in, let's start with the second question because it's easier. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, um, in, in Mexico, which is something I have never had to do here, I've never had to think about I need to dress cute in order to, you know, try to get like, I don't know, whatever money for this exhibition. I've never, or that I need to like, you know, hold my tongue because women are not supposed to speak in a particular manner. Like, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be, like, cute. And that's something that I certainly felt there um, at, in a professional level. Um, in a society level, um, it's even more complex because um, there are certain things that are accepted, like um, infidelity is accepted, like it's accepted that your husband is going to cheat and when you get married, you get married to like get married and you know that you're never going to get divorced. And it's something that, you know, even people from our generations, they would get married and you know that their husband were cheating. And, they, and you know that, you know, it's just like a very different scenario. Um, but to keep it in the professional way, uh, space, um, definitely, you know, having to very much negotiate your gender at work was something that you had to do. Also, um, I think that here there's a conscious um, desire to include women in museums. There, like if you think about all the great Mexican artists, like it's really hard to think about one woman. And if you do, it's probably like Melanie Smith who's foreign. And then there's Frida Kahlo, but Frida Kahlo was Diego's wife. So, and she's always put in exhibitions almost always in that context, you know, that she is Diego's wife. Well, even in Fort Lauderdale, it's that way, it's bizarre. Well, well, I mean, I think that one of, like, I think that certainly one can draw similarities, you know, and I think that's also a very interesting 
part, like in terms of like when we start looking at other places and how things are done there. Now, in terms of projects that would be, that one can consider fails and that had a lot to do with government, I did a project with um, Tania Bruguera, which is barely spoken about, and part of it is because of its political context. We did this in 2012, and it was called the, during election year in Mexico, and it was called the Partido de Pueblo Migrante, which is also, um, which was also an extension of what she was doing in New York, like the international movement. Like the Queen's yeah. Museum? The Queen, exactly. So one of our biggest problems that was that part of this project was a lot of, it was basically creating a political party in Mexico. But we were working for the government, so we couldn't really advertise that much that we were trying to create a political party. So, but at the same time, we needed to like satisfy like the artist um, needs because she wants to create objects and she wants to create her work. And you know, Tanya's work is very at times, it's very um, aggressive and very risque. Um, and she wanted to take risque actions, but for, for us, if we weren't meant to do that, that, mean, that meant, you know, my director getting fired, you know, like in a very, like, real way. And we were both foreigners, which is another thing to add, like, she was from Cuba, but she was nationalized Mexican, which is good, um, but I was an American, um, and I wasn't from there. So... In a way, you know, you can think about that project in terms of failure because we could never um, really fulfill the need of the artist to do an actual political party in parts of because in part by our position in that context by being technically workers of the government, like I was a government yeah worker. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to translate. Uh -huh. En la semana pasada hubo una reunión de mujeres artistas. Last week there was a meeting of women artists. Ajá, donde estaba Igmar Emel Hans, eh, bueno, varias artistas, mujeres. There were many of women artists. Ajá, que se reunieron para hacer una cosa que se llamó Invasorix. That got together to um, do something called Invasorix. Ajá, eran solamente mujeres it y la foto. It was all women and the it was all women and the picture. Que hacía la publicidad eran las mujeres vestidas de hombres. And the picture that the, that publicity was women dressed like men. Sí, eh, yo siento que las mujeres en México tienen she, mucha rabia contra los hombres. She feels like women in Mexico are very like has a, have a lot of anger towards men. Y no y, y siento que no logran crear una propia estructura desde sí mismas como mujeres. And that they're unable to create um, a structure within them as like their own structure as women. Y que sienten que tienen que tener la fuerza del hombre como el hombre. And that they have to have the strength of men as men, the, the, the strength of men, but as a, a, their strength. Mm -hmm. Para crear un equilibrio. To create and have a balance. Sí. But I don't know, I'm not very familiar, and I apologize, but I'm not very familiar with what happens in Fort Lauderdale, like what happens in Fort Lauderdale. Well, uh, Fort Lauderdale was, was the traditional free to follow. Oh, okay. Diego Rivera included in there as well, you know, it has Frida and Kahlo, and the exhibition pretty much, uh, I was speaking with a colleague about this, it pretty much celebrates their, their tenuous romance, but it yeah. doesn't really focus on what I felt would be more important on Frida Kahlo's work, hmm. and, and not focusing on the relationship so much, but I mean, I know it's important, but it made it more important than the work of Frida Kahlo, yeah. Yeah. and I thought that was a little problem, problematic. I would expect something like that would make more sense in Mexico, but having it in Colorado was a little bizarre and the way it was curated. Yeah. And it was even a blown up uh, photograph of the both of them just swooning at each other. It was really kind of strange in yeah. the context of a museum, you know, I think it felt yeah. kind of um, too promoting yeah. rather than talking about the actual content of the work. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead, sorry. No, I, I was wondering how, um, what would be the role of one of the <coughs> biggest 
contemporary uh, feminist who happens to live in Mexico City, actually. Her name is Dorothea de Puy, and she publishes uh, Petunia Magazine. Oh, yeah, I know Dorothy. Yeah. So I would like to... Well, Dorothy... I kind of wonder yeah. what her role in Mexico City changed. Well, yeah. I think that something that happens a lot there is that... Um, as foreigners, you have like um, uh, you have certain limits, and I think that like you can create certain discourses, but to a certain degree. So I think that I, see, you know, she's really she does this magazine, and she can connect people that way. But I wonder in terms of how much agency can one have from from a foreigner position, and I was you know a foreigner too, to really um, I don't know. Um, influence I was also you know when I started thinking about like this talk I was also interested in thinking about Miami and like because I'm still kind of new to the city so um, I was interested also in knowing more about like if situations like this like I'm sure that they happen here but like under which conditions right because I think like one of the things that your experience in Mexico City really points to is um the DIY sort of culture of like, you know, these institutions aren't working for us, or um, we've all hit the glass ceiling with the institutions and we still need another venue for something. Um, and so that DIY kind of impetus um, is very, maybe a good connector. But also I wanted to ask you, you know, um, another aspect of what we talked about when we were, when we were thinking about this talk was um, when you have these sort of institutional support systems that aren't working, like you don't, you can't get the funds or you can't get the space or whatever it might be, you figure it out what it is that you actually still need to make a really good exhibition working closely with artists or whatever that you know may be. So I think in a way it affords you to to determine what those you know those actual the real things are that you really really need, which you know someone may argue at other institutions. Um, that's that sort of sometimes gets left behind when everything else is is there. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there as also, you know, the things we learn and also what 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 is this DIY culture, you know, what's the the importance of it or the yeah yeah the alternative culture. Well, I mean, I think that like you know I like working in museums. Like they are really like great places for 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 a lot of things. Um, but I do think that it is important to try to work outside of them because museums are very, they know what they want. Mm. You know what I mean? They're not going to, it's very hard for them to take a risk mm. um, because we have a certain social mission that is very clear and that is very much um, uh, that we have to fulfill. So I do think that um, and again, I, I really enjoy working in institutions, but I do know that when I'm doing a project in an institution, um, that my project in one way or another is safe. Yeah. Like the potential for failure is really uh, reduced. Mm. You know, I can, I can have, you know, we can have bad reviews, but that doesn't mean that the artwork didn't work or that, you know, the, the you know, like it, it doesn't, I don't know. I def I believe a lot in the potential of failure and of, of, of experimenting, and I think that the alternative space or that great space outside of the institution really lends itself for a lot of potentials. Like just think about like the happenings in the '70s. You know, they weren't happening in museums or old and bookstore. Like you know, this type of 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 ways of challenging art and creating new art forms at times, not all the time, but I do think that at times alternative space can be a really good, um, 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 you know, generator or, or kind of like put you in that uncomfortable situation of, um, mm. of creating, of creation, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that making a good artwork, like making a good song is really hard. Like I don't think that it's easy and I don't think that, you know, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's easier at the museum or easier at the uh, whatever, you right. know. But I guess fundamentally there's always a need to find a space of one's own as an artist, you know, a, yes. a thing of one's own, a project, a 
collaborative space or whatever it might be. Yeah. Something that is really just real. Yeah. And I also think that, like, you know, in a place like Mexico City where there's, like, a lot of artists and not enough institutions mm. to house them, mm, um, there is, like, um, there is... The, the, the impulse to try to create your own space and to make the institution look at you, I think becomes even more obvious um, than at other places. So, so yeah, I totally, and before I started working in museums, like most of my like internships or whatever were alternative art spaces. Because mm -hmm. um, I do feel like that's the way to challenge, you know, and to really push um, the limitations of art. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, especially, I think especially in the terms of creation, you mm -hmm. know, in that process of creativity, of like creating a new right. work. Right, because that's where it like starts to crystallize, like what are we actually doing here? Like what, uh, what are we doing this for? What are we trying to do? Right, it kind of gets to the heart of the, the matter. Yes. And I also think that it's good, really good for the curatorial role also, mm -hmm. because I think that, um, Again, like in institutions, like things, their structure is very safe and you know all the steps. Like, yes, you have to like, you know, work and like do all the hard negotiations, but you know, it's very, um, like something that my old boss would tell me at my own museum, if an artist was doing, <coughs> was, as she would say, misbehaving or acting crazy, she would tell me, just tell them that their show is going to be canceled. Oh. Just tell them that. You know, like, you know, the, the, the power or the, the power play that yeah. at times institutions can have, maybe, I mean, I'm just putting out that at times it could be, you know, bad for the create, for the creative <coughs> process. I, well, I mean, and then while you said at SOMA, um, the, there was a directive to lose the curator. Yes, yes. But SOMA is strange because it's, in SOMA you are inside of the of the mainstream too, you know, because you have workshops with the uh, artists of the city, with the creators, and you have uh, revisiones. Like reviews. Yes, mm -hmm. with the... And then it's like a way... People criticize uh, SOMA for that, but in the same way, I think it is very important because the art world is a real world too, you know? Hmm. I want to say, when I went to Mexico, uh, I was thinking about to do a master in the <laughs> university, and the master I found was the San Carlos master. San Carlos is a um, university where Siqueiros um, study. So, uh -huh, yeah, in the past, no. Okay. And then the world there is not is not a real world. Uh, you know, your partners uh, they are not an. They are not very interesting, interested, interested about art oh. and the teachers, you know. And then, yes, the it's, it's good and bad. The mainstream. It's more or less a question. No. It was well, a question. Well, I think the question was like having the influence of the curator was perceived as a negative. Yes. Um, we had problems. Right. I, I had problems. No, you know. Uh, yes, but I say uh, all the space is for this. No, but uh, so, and then you know this right. promise that you didn't have, that you don't have when there is a curator. Right. Curator, no, because one person has the power to say, and right. then in in the place uh, where is no, where don't where is not a curator. We are in the same. Right, you're all yes. making decisions together and it's more like a collaborative as yes. opposed to just falling in line and doing what you're told. And it's our exhibition, no? And then right. I, I, I can't, you I can't fight right. with you. Right, right. I can't. You have to get to it instead yes. of it, yeah. We yeah. need to be together, yeah. no? And it was pretty, pretty cool because yeah. uh, I felt very comfortable with my group. Right. Yeah. But you said, Maria, like this relates, you found this interesting in terms of Miami also? Like this kind of, these thoughts with SOMA or just... Well, I think, well, I mean, I think that like, I mean, there's people here doing stuff like, you know, the Cannonball, 
which in a way is modeled by SOMA, actually. Oh. Um, you know, this idea of like a school. There's also people here kind of like trying to pull out their own galleries, um, which, you know, people are quite active. Um, of course, there's differences. Like, I think that, you know, and again, I'm kind of like a newcomer, but there, again, I did feel this energy to let's, what's our generation? What's our creative, you know, what do we have to say as artists collectively? Which I haven't, like, seen that here as, as much, but, you know, I'm sure that they might be out there. Like, I just, just because I haven't hmm. experienced it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, you know? Um, you know, certainly this space, the history of this space is pretty much tied to um, alternative uh, DUI, um, pro you know, propositions. Um, like the fact that there is space to use from property developers or... What yeah. yeah, yeah, like totally. I think that like, and again, I can be, you know, wrong, but if there will be a, a something that I would say is that I do see a lot of like pretty works, you know, mm -hmm. like pretty artworks, which yeah, um, here, here yeah. which <laughs> um, uh, which may, and at times I, I, I also wonder about Art Basel and what that creates in terms of like creating this bubble for a week that kind of like creates this idea of the market that is can be a little bit misleading, you know, and what that means to the yearly and more regional experience of Florida and Miami, um, which again could, you know, but I would say that, I would say that like, yes, certainly I, I, I wish I had sense more like this need for a generational, you know, kind of like, this is what we're doing, this is what we do. And just, yeah, then there's nothing wrong with pretty works. It's just, you know. Well, I mean, many other people may have opinions about this, but it's sometimes we've talked about it, I think, in terms of Miami's um, having this weird experience of building an art scene maybe in reverse I mean yeah so it's in terms of we had I mean of course there was activity here with real things going on before of Fossil, course of and course. those things are you know have their own uh, their own place um, but of course um, when our Basel dropped on the city then there became this sort of backwards effect where suddenly one of the most sophisticated and I mean sophisticated in terms of the market structures just dropped upon the city and then now there's sort of a question of well um, what are the structures by which we make art? Why should we make art? Where should we learn about art? Where can we make art? What is art? You know, all these things are actually coming really in backward steps from one of the most evolved um, aspects. And feel free to disagree with me. But um, in reference to what you're saying, as far as the collective consciousness within the city, I've noticed that there seems to be a tendency within most of the artists outside of our Basel, more like on the local scene, to try to convey the kind of metaphysical presence in their work for the most part. Can you say that? Can yeah, you unpack, unpack that a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Sanessa may be able to speak more about that, but his work is a good example of uh, touching upon uh, this metaphysical aspect as far as uh, portraying this aspect of the magic city or kind of like this, something that's outside of the material, you know, reaching more about conveying a sense of, of um, you know, just this emotional or spiritual aspect within the work. And I see that with a lot of the artists that practice in Miami. They're very conscious of trying to touch upon creating an experience at the moment. You're saying artists are interested in creating experience? Yes. Okay. And, and a metaphysical experience. And how? Uh, yes, true, they are. And I think what of course, she's talking about, like, it seems like the artists in Mexico Like yeah. But I like obviously everyone's very closely connected, you know, here, but I don't know if that's necessarily what they're doing. <coughs> through the work, I mean, it's just my I'm going to throw something out there. Um, this is something that, that happens quite regularly in these talks, um, and often it's not talked about. And, and really, what I hear often is that there is a certain kind of power that we are always faced as humans slash then artists. And um, 
you know, as one moves through the world, you have to be careful not to, you know, put your foot in your mouth, you lose your job, um, you don't get the funding that you want, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a, there's a, um, a, you know, really, it's a really complex system that you have to kind of maneuver as a human in three-dimensional space, this world that we know it to be. And often I find the art market, or you know, some people call it the art world, I don't think it really is that, that probably died a long time ago. Um, um, it, it's, it's, just, it's just shocking to me that often that people just, you know, I mean, just, just call it what it is. I mean, we're facing, um, whether it's government power or corporate power, you're facing something that is really quite, you know, influencing a large mass of people. Um, I mean, how do you talk to people that don't understand your language at all? They're busy watching television or reading crap, like Inquirer magazine, so on and so forth. I mean, the level of, of the mass or your the quote unquote audience, I hate to say this, but it, it's kind of, it's funny to me because I, I feel that as time goes forward, it's be, they're, they're becoming less and less informed about what really could or is happening in the, um, the, the three-dimensional world that they're existing. Right, so you're identifying two things. Like one is like the power structure, and two is this. Well, the power structure control controls that <clears throat> mass that we are trying to communicate with. The audience. Whoever it may be, yeah. I mean, depending on how you want to exist in that three-dimensional space. I mean, do you want to live in a little tiny cave somewhere and, and, and communicate with your neighbors and all the little pretty animals, or do you really want to try to engage a, a larger audience? So therefore, you are often, uh, once you start to really kind of heavily engage the market, you, you know, then you're demonized by others that are trying to pretty much do the same thing that you're doing, which is, you know, have the opportunity to speak to a larger audience, so then how do you engage in that? I mean, I first moved to Miami, and I had to live in a warehouse for two, two years without air conditioning. That was kind of my choice, but, you know, it was also an opportunity to me to kind of get to know the lay of the land, and, um, yeah, it was suffering, but it was good suffering. I'll never do it again. Um, but, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's just like these conversations really confuse me, I can't be honest with you. It's like, it's like it's never, no one really talks about what, what they are truly facing. And, it, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, is, is money. Those that have it and those that control it, they are the ones that are the, the disseminating the, you know, the information. Yeah. But your bigger point is how does that kind of control? I don't um, really how does care. It impact As an the artist, I, I focus, art? I focus my own core as best as I can to disseminate, I think, uh, how I perceive this three-dimensional world that we exist in. I mean, and this is and it's filled with, it's, it's filled with, like, I think, just like misleading ideologies constantly, you know, constantly being kind of constantly bombarded by, 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 by these ideas that just won't really get you much further than, than just, just being an indentured servant okay. to the system that's already in place. And the minute that you stick your neck out, you better have something to back it up somehow, some way. And often it's cash. In this day and age, more so now than ever before, it's cash. Or you get fucking lucky. Someone's going to pick you up and put you into the right place and then put you with a little bit of backing. I mean, that's just my perception of it. I could be completely wrong. Some well, people but, but call me your, angry and jaded. But no, but what is your actual point? Like, are you saying that... He's pointing to a structure. Yes. Right. And, it's like, never, to the limitations of that structure. Place. And the thing is this. Like... I mean, I don't know everyone's finances, but I am sure that we're all dependent on the structure. And that's that's like the main, yeah, we're all, like I have to get paid, you know, I have to, to eat, so I, I do what I have to do in order to do that. Now, I do wanna believe, for the sake of art making, and because I like wasting hours talking about art, that there is like a place that there's true creativity and that there's an art like there's an autonomous artwork out there and 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 I don't see anything wrong with trying to maneuver both structures. When I get worried is when things get too much to one side. Like if you're like just making work to sell and not really well, thinking all beyond. All institutions are, are headed in that direction. Yeah, I and this is why Every I. institution is headed in that direction. The, the, the whole notion of Fort Lauderdale. It's a blockbuster show. I mean that institution. Like, you know, it's notorious for them. I mean, granted, Bonnie Clearwater is over there now, but she's kind of like, you know, yeah. she's suffering because, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Fort Lauderdale, but it's, you know, just a lot of really kind of, you know, money-hungry white people. 
Okay, yeah. if I am understanding well, um, I'm sorry. It is, it is a, the, the, the first it. point when you feel the the need, the necessidad, the, the need, necessity, yeah. okay? the need, the need uh, to do another space, you know, another space without rules, uh, 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 far to the structure, yeah. where when you. No. But but you do need them. Yes. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to sell a knife thing. I do think you do need the market. Like you do need. That I think the trick is creating a new market and what that looks like. You know, like creating a new. Like I think Kuri Mansuto is a great example of that. Like they yes. created a new way of thinking about they sculpture. They say okay. You disagree. <laughs> yeah, you disagree. Yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, Mackenzie work uh, have talked mm -hmm. about this, and I mean it's. This is a set of rules that we coexist in, and the only way to uh, create a new is is I mean just the just the word new is an utopia because we don't know anything new aside from the set of rules pre-existing. Yes, but you can create situations. So, It'll so when comes back to the same point, I mean, you're, you want to create a, an alternative space. You won't be able to sustain the alternative alternative space without becoming a uh, locus project. It's a yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> locus But you know, it, it was yeah. a, a plot that ended up becoming institutional. Yeah. But I also because yeah. you need to get funded somehow. Otherwise, you have no uh, uh, circulation yeah. of money. Yeah. So, um, uh, so there's a capitalist uh, structure that has no failure so far. So, whatever we do, and, and in that sense, I truly believe Mackenzie work is right, unless. The capitalist structure per se fails. There's no other way but to fall into capitalist uh, uh, me methods. Even if you go to curatorial studies, if you go to art studies, if you go to philosophy programs, whatever you approach this thing from, its center point is the same. It is. I think it's capital. a very important point. Uh, it's a capital. But I wouldn't like to be like, because it also, it's, it's, it, it, it also seems slightly pessimistic, or it seems pessimistic. No, 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 no. no, no, no. And I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, for example, just show me why, why should we be pessimist in the world that I live in? But I wonder what is the point, because. Uh, <laughs> the point is, no, I, I understand. Accelerationist. They talk about, okay, if we are in this system, let's accelerate it as quick as possible so we can uh, creatively <laughs> find some other, uh, I mean, let it commit suicide, right? <laughs> and that's not being pessimist, it's actually, uh, it's being positive that after this, you will find tools to build something different. Yeah. I think I mean, what I keep thinking of is what is this notion of expectation? So we're, we're, we're cruising towards, all right, everyone's going to get folded into this capitalist system. Um, our expectations are to, as an artist, um, you know, maybe defining them, thinking, oh, well, was I planning to get rich? Or was I planning to just make a living? Or was I planning to escape the system? Or... Um, This is about curators, right? This, this yeah. I'm this curious is. about what the curators, the curators only have to, to say do an about exhibition, that. No? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm an artist. I yeah. just kind of gave you, yeah. kind of laid it out. Um, uh, yeah. As sure. All the curators in the room. How many are there here? Right now? <laughs> If you don't mind putting your hands up, I'd really like to know. Oh well, I would say. I mean. I mean, and I'd like to hear your just off the ideas top, about I mean, the trajectory. Just off the top of, of my head, is that yeah. I, 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 that I accept, I accept <laughs> the market. I, I don't uh, pretend that it's going to be different. Um, I do think that it's possible to take advantage of it to push forward the projects that you think are the best for the artists that you think are the best and worthy of the yeah. resources. But based on your on your on your institution's mission statement. Not necessarily. I'm an independent curator, so are many of the other people here. So um, independent? I don't know about that. I really don't. <laughs> 
can say whatever you want. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I mean, no. I don't want to tell you. I'm just telling you that there are many different ways that curators work. They don't just work for an institution necessarily. As do um, artists. They don't. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not fair to put them yes. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Okay, go ahead, Alicia. Right, so about 10 years ago, I ran with a friend who was an artist. We ran an alternative space. They got tagged an artist run alternative space because that's what everybody wanted to support, even though I was like, I'm not an artist, nobody cares. <laughs> So there's autonomy there. Yeah, I so mean, so yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. System, but one thing I would say is, one thing I've noticed in Miami that was different, I don't know if it's the same now, but I'll say it is, is the, the idea of what's success meant, I think, for a lot of artists there was quite different to what it means here, because it was just so unlikely you were ever going to do really, really well and sell a lot of work. Yeah. 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 But I think here it's different because it's very clear there is a lot of money swirling around and everybody could have some, but it's their work is whatever is considered saleable right. Yeah. collectors here. And even in that same model, like I always hear artists from like the seventies that would have that. They wouldn't have this, the expectation of becoming rich. Right. You basically want to make your work, but the system, or at least the economy was at such a level that you could work like two weeks a month and then make enough work for, you know, live for three months from that. And now it's like you work 90% of the time so you can have 10% from your own personal space. Yeah. It's not sustainable in that same way. I don't know if it's about when you guys had like, how open was it? Yeah. It, I mean, I love lots of speech and some of the things that so places. Yo creo que el caso de Cráter Invertido es muy claro acá, como en esta discusión. Yeah. Well, I think 
really like tension. It's, it totally, it totally it's tension, and yeah, there. and it calls attention to the to the um, thing that we touched upon a little bit, which is like, what are the essentials to make something worthwhile that you actually care about at all? That the artist actually cares about at all? You know, what are the what are the? It's always really um, like I'm generally curious for a right. Once you say that, you're kind of free. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, so a lot of the time, I think sometimes that makes them make more interesting work, but it's also about the obvious and the possibilities of the things and just materials. Right. But then, you want to make a sculpture or not? Yeah. But when you know, when you say somebody, like, hey, right, but when you say, like, hey, I don't have a budget, like, you're not necessarily worried about somebody, like you know that the person who's making the work with you actually really wants to make the work. That's true, yeah. I don't always think about that, I guess, but yeah, that's true. I think that um, when I put that on the table, it might also just like change. Okay. Sure, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Which is also yeah, sort of interesting because I think a lot of my thing, I have a space, but, you know, aside from that, all I really have in terms of, of, like, facilities is whatever I can, like, physically do for you, I can do that, you know, so, so and then trying to engage people, and, you know, I think the artist will then kind of have to look at that and respond off of, like, okay, how yeah. I want to make work under those particular conditions, mm-hmm. and I mean, you know, I've looked into the idea, too, like, how could I take this idea and, you know, employ it different ways? And still, um, I don't know, and just like talking to a lot of people, there's like all these really strange things about, you know, the maneuvering of, of like funding and whatnot. Um, well, it's like, when does curatorial work become a, more like a partnership, yeah. or when is it yeah. the curator works for you, or the artist works for the curator? Like, you know, that whole balance is really strange. Oh, and your program, it's a partnership. yeah, yeah I think your I've program is interesting there. too, because you, you have a rapid fire, you well, know. You should yeah. explain it to, I don't think they're familiar yeah. with this project. Right, so Andrew. Yeah, I'll let him speak for himself. But he has uh, his project Meta Gallery is is really founded upon um, this hyper programmed mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. So there's like many many more openings than there would be in a normal span of time, and it's all about this like hyper productive space. Yeah, sort of like very fast moving, fast paced, um, minimal budget, like really no downtime. Yeah. In the space, um, like when it was done here, we were on a rotating basis of programming every three days. Oh wow! So, yeah. So there was always, you know, these things just like how to maximize use of space and, uh, but really still do things um, sort of minimally, but you know, part of the thing doing things minimally was that you know, it allowed for a lot more experimentation, it didn't have some of the certain pressure, but um, I think it worked in, in its own particular way of working. Um, but, you know, also one of the things about it that just kind of dealing with different artists and projects that I've kind of had some weird feelings about when it comes to also like the public funding issues, you know, every single funding thing, when they bring up is, you know, one of the big lines that's on all of this, how does this like benefit the greater public? Mm-hmm. And it always turns into this weird like PR game, you know, like how do you, you know, how does whoever gave you the money or whatever, like, you know, how, you know like this is generating 
this is helping them sure. more generally. But I mean, to throw it at, back at you, do you assume that, you know, do, do any of us assume that when we're given money, mm -hmm. it comes with no strings attached? Or that, you know, mm -hmm. should we just, should we just say that we need this money for our stuff and we deserve it and we you know and we and we should have it for no reason and it, i just it's a very um it, it's it's a it's something that uh it's very difficult to question i i wanted to say um uh, just to just to answer your question and also i i, I wanted to say that we did like when we were doing projects we did have artists that said to us we need $700 to make our project. We had that experience and that meant that the project could not be done because we didn't have any money. So we're like, sorry, but that's not happening. So it, it was also not all peaches and cream. Yeah. Um, uh, and to answer your question about, I think that like the market and curatorial work, I do think that the market also makes work harder for us because like- For curators. Yeah, for, of course. Because for example, you might see work that you like and that you, su that you would support, but um, auction houses and market value are telling you something different. So you also always have to be very like, aware of, of those type of things when you are you know, creating exhibitions or acquiring works or whatnot. So I, I, wouldn't, I would say that, you know, that we also feel the pressures of the market. Um, yeah. Well, you're engaged in it, so that doesn't shock me at all. I mean, you're there. <laughs> well, actually, you have no way around it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, just, yeah. You know, just go back to your, you know, your house or your studio. Then. I mean, you, you're trying to engage that larger you know, thing that we all have to somehow you know, talk to. I mean, that's what, at the end of the day, it's a conversation. I, I'd hope that, you know, I mean, I, sometimes when I talk to some, some curators, I'm just like, I have no idea like what you are saying. Mm. I really don't. I mean, I, I, and on top of that, I, I don't find it interesting because it's it's actually somehow too much involved in this thing that we call the market. Of course, they're always saying that it's not because it's something yeah. that they're doing and they're somehow not part of it. And that's, well, that, that I find really kind of weird. Well, I mean, I do think that um, museums are not like, you know, and I come from a museum background, like we're not... We don't work at galleries. At galleries, you know, we are not necessarily at the auction house. You know, our work is to create history. Yes, by legitimizing, we are giving some type of, um, pre, you know, we're kind of saying this is important culturally for the social good, which does adds value to artwork. Sure. But we're not, you know, in the nonprofit sector. I th I think that it's not as cutthroat as somebody that's dealing artworks and really looking at, um, uh, you know, generation, generation, generating um, uh, value fast, because that's another part of that, that they want to sell work cheap so they can resell it at a higher money and make money quickly. Um, yeah. I wanted to uh, add, I mean, it, I agree, I understand that on your part, you might feel like, a, okay, yeah, sometimes you feel pressured but you have no choice but to feed the ladder. Because at the end, the museum is not only the walls, it's a board of trustees with particular interest. There's a group of uh, directors with particular interest. There's also certain numbers to, to make, etc., etc. But. Um, See, I mean, I feel like, uh, again, we go back to feeding the, the big beast, <laughs> and then the beast is eating us out at the same time. It's like a, you, you give food from one side, and from the other side is taking the, the claws and doing something. Um, like, for instance, there's a beautiful example that recently happened in Barcelona. The, the head curator of the Contemporary Art Museum in Barcelona, he made a show in, in which one of the, the, the sculptures, installation kind of, was extremely irreverent and it was almost making fun of the local royalty, right? Oh yeah, the one so with the sculpture with the... What yeah. happened is that immediately he got uh, he got he got called out 
and he said, well, I mean, I'm, I'm the head curator of this museum. I think I deserve to be trusted. I selected this group of artists and I made a serious uh, research about it. The board of trustees da, 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 started hammering that guy to the point that he had to write an open statement saying, well, maybe I made a mistake in the public eye. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I chose the wrong artist. And so what happened is that the rest of the curators at the museum, among the artists and amongst many other people who actually were informed about it, went after him saying, how did you do this? You were strong, you were supporting yourself to the point that yes, you have to trust uh, curatorial uh, independence. Well, what happened is that in less than five days, and it is recently, recently published, he resigned. Mm. But before resigning, he opened the door of the museum for everybody to go see the show. Mm. The show is one of the uh, uh, highest visited in one night in Barcelona. Right, 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 right. So now many other uh, institutional and independent curators around the world are supporting him, backing him. Right. There's instances so, right, where so these institutions sculpt the flames and then they... The yeah. scope plasticity, you know? I mean, yeah. how can this uh, strings are flexible to the point of supporting your ideals or to destroy you? Right. Well, I, I want to give um, uh, Maria and um, Manuela the last word because it's actually already 8.30, so yeah. we came to it so fast, but, um, you know. Yeah. Do you have a closing... Thought or, um, and then we'll just I guess them. my my only closing thought in relation to what you're saying is that um, I also think that as an artist, it's really uh, good to be really aware of of the type of institutions that you want to show, the type of people you want to make business with. You know what I mean? Like it, it, that should also be a very like conscientious choice. Mm -hmm. You know. Like, you shouldn't, want, you know, like, and I did that myself when I would start working, like, which type of museums I want to work with, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that, um, that, yeah, like, I just say that. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'm dependent on the system, too. Like, there's no... But that is why I believe in trying to create other avenues and other, you know, trying to take advantage of other possibilities because I, you know, Yo diría que I would say that. Bueno, yo no soy curadora, yo soy I'm not, artista. I'm not a curator, I'm an artist. Y yo crecí en una ciudad muy pequeña, en un país que ahora está muy conocido, pero antes era muy poco conocido. And then I grew up in a small village in a country that a few years ago wasn't as known, but now is very known. Que ahora que estaba sumido en la violencia. Because of the violence. En fin. Many y, other things. Y para mí, and pro, for me, promover, mover, o sea, promover el hecho de que el trabajo de otros artistas que yo conozco circule and y llegue a mi ciudad para mí ya es un acto político en digamos for me like um, the fact that um promoting artists the work of friends and promoting that those works get back to my city or to other venues to me that's a political act y para mí tiene sentido si yo veo esta ecuación porque yo estoy de acuerdo contigo y yo creo que claro efectivamente siempre pasa que cuando creamos una estructura que pretende ser independiente Después es, es, es absorbida por el sistema. Siempre sí. sucede eso. Pero sí creo que el sistema cambia un poco después de haberse devorado ese pequeño ser diferente a lo que había antes. She's saying that she believes in what you're saying, that like, um, um, you know, even structures that pretend to be independent get consumed by the mainstream structure, but she does believe that even after that consumption, the mainstream structure has been at least slightly affected. Altered. Para mí la única esperanza que, que puedo ver en un mundo así catastrófico como el que tú dices The only hope that you see in your catastrophic world yes, Es pensar Es to think 
y procurar nuestras pequeñas comunidades. And so it's to think about small communities mm -hmm. and really protect those. Oh, thank you. Thank you both so much.